really, really good here to be today. Lots of things to talk about. And uh, when I was a kid, I used to love to make things. Kites, all kinds of different things. And a lot of kids today are not making things. And I think that's a real shame. Because making things, uh, well, it made life fun for me. Figure out how to make different things fly. And as you know, when I was a little kid, I had severe autism. I didn't learn to talk until I was four years old. I was very lucky to get into very good early intervention. And my grandfather was a co-inventor with the autopilot for airplanes. And we'd go visit him and would ask endless questions about why is the sky blue, you know, why is grass green. We'd go down and see how the tide gates worked. And we got to get kids back working with real things. I've worked for many, many years on designing equipment in the cattle industry. And I worked with lots of skilled tradespeople. They were the quirky guy that today would be put in special ed. And we need these people. Right now, the hotel that I'm in has broken hot water. And they should have it fixed by the time I get back tonight. But I'm getting very concerned about infrastructure coming apart and not having the people to fix that infrastructure. Also in my own industry, for example, in the poultry industry, the Italians are making all the equipment now. And the reason for that is four-year-olds, five-year-olds get to work with tools. I'm seeing too many kids today, they might be 16 years old and they're still playing with Legos. Legos are great, but let's start adding tools. So in Calling All Minds, I've got my fifth grade shop project in there, where you learn how to use the coping saw. And I was the second girl in uh, my school to get to take wood shop. My favorite classes were sewing, wood shop, and art. And my mother always worked to develop my ability in art. Now, if I hadn't had that, I wouldn't have gone anywhere. Because in designing things, you have the industrial design side. That's the art side. Then you also have got the engineering side. Take the iPhone, for example. Steve Jobs was an artist. Good chance he was on the spectrum. He made an interface that was easy to use. The more mathematically inclined engineers, they had to make it work. That's the different kinds of minds working together. I had a wonderful trip in October down to Cape Kennedy. What I learned when I went to Cape Kennedy is there's all kinds of um, geeks and misfits down there. They have labels today. So the right stuff rolled the rockets. But the geeks and the misfits and the kids that were different they built the stuff. And I'm saying that absolutely seriously. You go out to Silicon Valley, half those programmers out there, they're on the spectrum. Most of them are not diagnosed. But in working on some of the projects I have in Calling All Minds, you're going to have to experiment. Because on my bird kite, the exact materials I had as a child are not readily available. Yeah, there's probably some weird website where you can buy them but not just really easy to get. And there's a special rough surface art paper. And rough surfaces affect aerodynamics. So I got to looking into why golf balls have dimples. And they fly further when they have dimples. And that was an accidental discovery. People found that their scarred up, cut up golf balls worked better than ones that were nice and round. And in my little bird kite, I put little wing tips, just like modern airliners have today. And you look at a lot of the modern airliners, you'll see how they've experimented with the different shapes. I want to get kids into the idea of just figuring out how things work, get them to figure out doing stuff. Also, hands-on classes teach practical problem solving. A lot of kids today, they get too worried about making a mistake. Well, if my, uh, one of my projects didn't work, I had to figure out how to make it work. In fact, going back as a grown-up and recreating these things wasn't all that easy because I didn't have the same materials. And the other thing I get asked about all the time is different ways that people think. I am a photorealistic visual thinker. Everything I think about is a picture, and that helped me in my work with animals because I looked at what the cattle see. And when we had an eclipse on our campus, I, I discovered, I didn't know the trees did this, the leaves of the tree would act like little pinhole cameras and make hundreds of little eclipses. And I watched students at my university just walking over that when we had a 95% eclipse. Most of the students didn't pay attention to it. And when I went down to Cape Kennedy, I saw something in the Mars launching pad that should not be there. 
a raccoon walked down the steps and he just waddled away. And then I got to thinking, oh, what have you been chewing? What things have you been chewing that you absolutely shouldn't have been chewing? And the thing I want to ask you, take some innovators like Thomas Edison. He was labeled an adult hyperactive high school dropout. What would happen to him today? Steve Jobs bullied in school. He had a terrible time in school. Uh, Jane Goodall started her famous work with a two-year secretarial degree. She started out as a secretary. So this brings up a really important thing. You gotta work really hard, but then you also have to see the door. When she saw becoming Dr. Leakey's secretary, a door into something a whole lot bigger and a whole lot better than being Dr. Leaker, Leakey's secretary. I've read about dyslexic CEOs. I want to see these kids that are different getting out and doing things. And a lot of the skilled tradespeople that I worked with in steel and concrete work, they've retired. Recently, I went to a very large specialized machine shop, just very recently, within the last month, and they had bought new machine tools, computerized machine tools. They were all from Japan. Why from Japan? Because we've taken out the hands-on classes. Other countries are keeping that stuff in. And you're gonna need that to fix your subway before it totally breaks. <laughs> and I'm saying that really, really, really seriously. I had great teachers that got me, got me going. My science teacher gave me interesting science projects. And when I did the Ames Optical Illusion Room, they wanted me to figure it out myself. Not just show me how to do it. I had to figure out how to make it. And let's get into favorite books when I was a child. Which one? one of my most favorite books when I was in about third grade was about famous inventors. I loved how they just figured out things. Thomas Edison was yeah. one of them, there was Eli Whitney and the cotton gin, and Elias Howe and the sewing machine. Another book that was favorite was The Wizard of Oz, um, Curious George because he was naughty, and uh, Eloise, I really liked that, and uh, Black Beauty. You know, books were a really important part of my life. Now there's kind of three different kinds of thinking. There's the photorealistic visual thinker like me. Then there's a the more mathematical pattern thinker. That's the person that's um, gonna be the computer programmer. And some of these kids that are really good at math, the teacher will say, well, you're gonna have to show your work. Stephen Hawking did not show his work. <laughs> he did it all in his head. Uh, the visual thinkers, my kind of mind, can't do algebra. And I'm getting very concerned they might get screened out because of this requirement. Let's move on to geometry and trigonometry. And I had a bunch of brain scans done. I found out, yes, I am a visual thinker. Now I get asked all the time, what was more difficult for me in getting my career started? Being autistic or being a woman? Being a woman was much worse. Being a woman in the cattle industry in the 70s was really difficult. There were no women working out in the yards with the cattle. And since I was a woman, I had to make sure that I was, I had to be better than the guys. This brings up a really interesting thing in terms of careers. First of all, people get interested in careers they get exposed to. And if you take all the hands-on stuff out of the schools, the kids aren't getting exposed to enough stuff to even figure out what they might want to do. And Sheryl Sandberg in her book, Lean In, wrote that a woman wants to be at the 90% level of knowledge for her to take the job. A guy will take it at the 60% level. When I did that project of the dipping vats that was shown in the movie, I was at the 60% level. And I said, give me three weeks. I had no idea how to do the reinforced concrete stuff. Boy, I had to scurry around and get the right drawings, get that figured out. And I'm getting worried about, um, you know, a lot of smart students getting screened out. I'm also seeing too many students where they're becoming their labels. They go back and forth to maybe an autism meeting, then I go out and I visit this machine shop, so I'm going back and forth between the different worlds. You know, so I want to see kids get out there and just be everything that they can possibly be. Another thing about hands-on, you need to touch to perceive. I noticed a very strange thing that happened. I watched my industry switch from doing everything with hand drafting going into um, computer drafting. And we started getting a lot of drawings with a lot of weird mistakes on them. Like the center of the circle was not the center of the circle. And the reason for this is they'd never drawn anything by hand and they'd never had built anything. 
I've got students today, one of my classes, and they have a drawing assignment. They have no idea how to use a scale ruler. They don't know what a compass is. So the projects in Calling All Minds range from very simple things like snowflakes drawing with compasses to things like the optical illusion room, stereoscope. A lot of kids ought to be interested in that because the, um, the virtual reality headsets are just a variation of the old-fashioned stereoscope. It works exactly the same way. So what I want to do now, I always like to just open it up for a whole lot of questions. And we'll just answer questions until I get the uh, signal from the people here at Barnes Noble that we need to go on and uh, get some books signed. So let's just do questions. Okay, right there. Yes, Deborah, you're uh, uh, an inspiration for all of us. I, I guess my question, being someone who works in the educational system, um, and really wants to change it from within because I, I see all the all the inadequacies of it. Let's, I, let's talk more specific about this. What, There's a tendency to get too many generalities. What, why do you think academics don't understand the importance of hands-on learning through production and and hand, and um, pro, uh, project-based and, and making tangible things happen? Well, what, why, is, what do we? How do we convince learned, them? You see, as a visual thinker, I'm a bottom-up thinker. And one thing that's been very interesting for me is I've learned that the way artificial intelligence works is a bottom-up thinker. Okay, so there's a there's a, a iPhone app that can diagnose cancer and uh, skin skin melanoma, and it's shown here's a whole bunch of melanoma pictures, here's a whole bunch of mosquito bites and other kinds of pictures, and then it learns how to categorize it. That's the same way that I think. And when you think in words, you tend to overgeneralize about things. And then you've got people that are too far away from the real world. What's going on in the real world? It all becomes an abstraction. And, and uh, you know, the big managers, they got to get out of the office and see what's going on out in the front lines. You know, I've, the things that I've done, you know, I've got to drag the suits out of the office and see what's going on. I'll, now, I think specific examples of where a suit needs to get dragged out of the office was de-icing a plane at the Omaha airport. They had this poor kid in this open bucket, I call it ice bucket from hell machine, open bucket, de-icing fluid going all over him. He's got to work a whole shift in that. Yeah, you need to get in closed buckets. You know, they need to take the suits in the office and stick them in that machine. <laughs> and he sprayed the window on my plane, and he was absolutely beyond miserable. That's just ridiculous. Uh, you know, that's the people in the office getting too far away. Now, you can use that kind of machine if you have a little teeny airport, and you go out and you spray one plane and you run back into the terminal, then it's okay. But whoever bought those trucks, you know, never ever had to be outside all day in an open bucket one sleet storm. You see, now I tend to think specific examples. That's something that's extremely specific. Let's look at your subway problems. You're gonna be in serious problems. Uh, I was at a conference in Pittsburgh and the water mains broke at the uh, Pittsburgh Sheridan. This was a month ago. We almost had to do a 900 person conference with porta potties. This almost happened. This was about a month ago. You see, that's something specific and I'm very concerned about infrastructure falling apart. As I drive around the country, I see some states take care of their bridges and others are horrible. But you see, that's specific. And skilled trades are not for everybody. But there are certain kids that if they got exposed to it, it'd be the perfect thing for them to do. And those jobs are not gonna get replaced by computers. Absolutely will not get replaced. But as a bottom-up thinker, I think specific also comes up as a picture. I'm now seeing this poor kid freezing his butt off. He had to spray my window because it's covered with ice. He's like, from here to there, real close to me. I looked right at him, and the stuff went back all over him. I really, that kid was freezing. Hi, um, are you taking questions about autism, or just more specifically about like the thinking minds of the hands-on application you've been talking about? Well, I'm always, with all kids, we need to be doing a lot more of the hands-on stuff. But I've worked with a lot of skilled trades people. No, I mean, I'm sorry, but I'm sorry, my question is like, are you asking, can I ask a question about autism in yep, particular? Yeah, you can. Okay. Um, as someone myself, I was in the exact same situation that uh, you were. I was nonverbal till I was um, 
four years old. Yeah, that's the same as me. Yeah, and um, I had I had like a much more developed uh, mathematical ability. And going through the school system, I was like kind of very very immature, and that picked out. Um, by the time I was in my twenties, my maturity I would say was starting to like get better and better. I would say my maturity level is probably at like ten years uh, below my age, but it's definitely improved. Like. What do you do? What have you done with your math ability? What do you do I now? work as a data scientist at AT and T. Well, good. You're working as a data scientist at AT and T. That's wonderful. As a contractor, I mean, <laughs> but it's certainly something up there. Um, it wasn't easy. I had to do like a lot of introspection and so on. But my question is, is like I notice, I kind of felt very hopeless when I was very young because you know it seemed like I would never mature, but I did mature. And is it that? People on the spectrum, do they mature because of bitter life experience? Well, the, thing is, the thing is, as a bottom-up thinker, the only way you can mature is you have to load data into the database. So the more things you get out and do, then you'll learn how to do It's like you intellectually better, understand better, better. it. It's like you intellectually understand it, right? You, know, you learn by, everything is learned by specific example. That's why it's so important you know, to get out and do things. Now the thing that I learned to do when I first started selling jobs, is I learned to show off my portfolio. So I'd go in for an interview and I'd lay out the big drawings I had done, the very professionally made brochure, pictures of jobs, articles I've done for trade magazines. I call that the 30 second wow. And so I let my portfolio sell me by showing the work. If you're doing programming, you know, you want to have some programming stuff that you can show off. And the mistake that people make is put too much stuff in it. But I didn't actually feel like I was a full-fledged grown-up until I was 40. Yeah, it's like, it's like it takes longer. Now, I've been out to Silicon Valley. I've seen the programmers out there. They're all undiagnosed. Half of them are on the spectrum. Uh, we wouldn't even have a, any electronics here. You know, uh, Thomas Edison was a hyperactive adult high school dropout. <laughs> and he would probably be labeled autistic today. See, this is what worries me. You see one geek's going to NASA or going to SpaceX, and there's another geeky kid's going to the basement to play video games, and then the same geeky cat is a visual thinker. I don't get hung up on the labels, because I see visually specific examples of different people, like a guy who would be labeled autistic today as stutters, as ADHD, awful student, dyslexic, took welding in high school, um, started making things and selling them at uh, the county fair, and now owns a big metal fabrication company. You see, this is the sort of thing, and he's 60s now. This is the sort of thing that makes me get kind of crazy when I go back and forth in the autism world and all the stuff I've done with skilled trade things. And even things I've done out of Silicon Valley, you know, I'm seeing the same kind of people going in different directions. And one, one of the reasons why your subway is such a mess is because, um, uh, you know, kids aren't even getting shown skilled trades. The city of Pittsburgh better do something before their water system falls apart. Uh, hi. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just, I read about you. I even did a research paper about you last Women's History Month, and I'm a girl with autism myself, and I'm not really that much into math. In fact, my math teacher pretty much, the way she explains math is like, she may as well be explaining another language because it sucks. Well, one, if you can't do algebra, why don't you go on and try geometry? Oh, I did! And how was geometry? Not... Was that better? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I laugh, but I'm nervous in front of famous people because you're utterly famous. <laughs> I read your autobiography and everything. Oh. <laughs> Inspired by you, and well, thank you. Let me tell you, kids at school can be mean. You're really, really, really mean. Well, I started out my career one little project at a time. It started with sign painting, doing hand painted signs. It makes me sad nobody does hand painted signs anymore. So I started out one little sign at a time. First one was for a beauty shop, and the sign painting gradually morphed over and. And you know, do a little tiny corral system for a very small ranch, and I was down there every day making sure it was absolutely right. You start out one little project at a time. And then the other thing is you gotta work hard. 
but then you also got to see the doors and you got to have the confidence to walk through it. There's a scene in the movie where I get the editor's card. That scene happened. Then I started writing for the magazine, but I had to have the guts to go up and get the card. And then when I got asked to do that dip that job, I was at the 60% level of competence. I said, yes, give me three weeks. Gotta remember, pre-internet, it would take time to um, find out how to do the concrete reinforcement work. But I went through the door. Now I've seen some guys go in and try to do a job at the 20% level and try to wing it and seen a $20 million mistake made because they wouldn't listen to anybody. I actually was on a project where that happened. Well, you got to work hard, but you've also, when the door to opportunity opens, you've got to have the confidence to walk through it. You've got to, you've got to do it. Hello, Temple. Um, first of all, I want to thank you because you changed my mind. You helped me to understand my family. Um, we're all on the spectrum, but high functioning. And um, you talked about different brain shapes. And that was kind of, I'm a visual person. And that was my, my way into understanding that my big brother and my father in particular are just very special brain shapes. They have enormous capacity in ways that I don't have. Um, well, there's some people the visual thinkers, because you take a great big factory. What I've observed, okay, and I've worked on a big projects like for major meat companies, the drafting department, or my department, will lay the entire plan out, like I'd lay out all the stockyards. That type of design, and then even in things like all kinds of conveyor systems, mm -hmm. uh, that's laid out by the drafting department. Then you've got the quirky guys in the shop that invent all kinds of you know, mechanical equipment. I just went to a library um, at uh, North Carolina State University that has the same warehouse handling system for books that's used in the meat industry. It's the exact same thing, except instead of getting boxes of meat, it's finding boxes of books. <laughs> But somebody had to figure out how to make an automated warehouse work. That's done by the guys in the shop. And then you degree to mathematical engineers. Yep, we need you. Boilers, refrigeration, pre-stressed concrete, roof trusses, soil compaction. So you've got to have the whole team. But I was looking at some stuff where they were making doing tunnels. Some of these boring machines. Mm -hmm. Some of that stuff gets designed by the hands-on visual thinkers. Well, you've actually changed my question because I was going to ask which which brain shape do you enjoy interacting with the most? But really, you've mentioned well, first uh, thing. I mean, of course, I'm a visual thinker. But the thing is, the first thing you have to understand is that people think differently. And uh, when I worked on uh, Calling All Minds, Betsy Lerner, my editor and agent, worked with me on the book, and she's a completely verbal thinker. And uh, she, and, but but she helped put the book together. This is where the different kinds of minds. My book, The Autistic Brain. Richard Panic uh, made the structure because us visual thinkers, we ramble around, we associate. So the first step is you have to realize that people think differently, and and um, well, there's linear and non-linear. And then, well, I'm totally non-linear, but in order to make a book work, it has to be more linear. And and the first step is realizing, and you see, you need both kinds of minds to to do projects all kinds of projects. I'm going to slip in a second question. Any comments on the Gigafactory and Elon's retooling it to include more humans? Wait a minute, what's this now? Uh, just wondering if you might have a comment on the development of the Gigafactory and Elon Musk's recognition that he needs more humans on this almost completely automated production line? Well, there's some things that people are going to, are going to do better. And, and I you know, I've noticed well, the use of robotic arms in the meat industry. And what I've noticed, you go into a plant and they've got a pretty conventional robotic arm. But then there's a tool on the end of that robotic arm. It's not electronic, super clever. That's made by the guy in the shop. But then the thing that upset me is there's all kinds of innovative stuff there and it's no longer made in this country. Because we've taken the shop classes out. I went up to a school in Canada in January and they had a big poster on the wall of this high school. And it said, three pathways to success. Learn by doing, skilled trade apprenticeship, going to two year, um, they don't call them community colleges in Canada, but basically two year community college, um, certificate, job, or university. And they put them on equal footing. You know, when your subway really gets messed up, get a little respect. 
I've been, I, I read the New York Times on airplanes. I know what's going on in your subway. And making the station pretty is not going to fix it. You talked a lot about being a visual thinker and about education today. What picture comes to your mind when you think of the U.S. education system? Well, I saw the poster at the Canadian school. I'm seeing some pictures of the subway when I've talked about that. You know, but it tends to be specific and it's not abstract. I, I have to think of specific examples of things. Give me, ask me, ask me something. Well, again, I'll tell you how my mind accesses it visually. A preschool classroom. A what? Preschool classroom. Preschool classroom, I'm actually seeing my old kindergarten classroom, Mrs. Cole's um, classroom. And uh, when the kids had a birthday, they got to have a bow put on their chair. But since my birthday was in August, I never got a bow on my chair. And that's one of the things I'm thinking about. You know, it tends to be specific. exceptional students and I'm wondering if you ever I have two questions but I'm wondering if you've ever heard the term I've worked with lots of twice exceptional students in the school of trades and I know two of them that own metal fabrication companies wow and own them I just want to say for teachers that work with students who are twice exceptional I think you're an inspiration for us to know that what we're doing can result in such great outcome for them and so I think that I want to thank you for that and well, sharing your you, experience. Thank you. I really, really appreciate that. The other thing is kids have got to learn how to work. This is the yes. other big problem I'm seeing. When I was 13, my mother got me a sewing job. And when I was uh, 15, I went away to an expensive boarding school. And for the first three years, I ran the horse barn. But I was learning something really important. I was learning how to work. But I'm saying too many kids that get a label, smart kids that get a label, and they're not learning any work skills. They're not even learning things like shopping. There's a tendency to overprotect these kids. We need to be getting them out doing things like a dog walking at around 11 or 12 years old. Uh, there's plenty of dogs here in New York City that need walking. Um, the volunteer at a farmer's market, um, they'll help out a street vendor, and then the instant the kids legally needs to get a real job. Because I'm not, I, there's a discipline to work. And it's a different skill than academics. And we need to be start teaching working skills, how about synagogue jobs and church jobs when they're 10 and 11, passing around the plate, passing out programs. A little older, they can set up chairs, they can help with the food. Something where it's on a schedule outside the family. And so with that said, I have a student that I was doing biographies with, and I decided to show him some of your clips, I think it was a TED talk, and when as soon as you said, I think in pictures, he's like, hey, that's just like me. So with a student who's a visual learner, I find it as a literacy teacher really, really extremely hard to engage them in the reading and writing well, process. Well, I liked reading, and now by third grade, I couldn't read. They were using those horribly boring, awful Dick and Jane books. And, Mother taught me to read with phonics, and she did it in a very simple way. She just put all the alphabet up on the wall with pieces of paper. So, okay, A has two sounds, A and A, ah, B is B, and then how to mix the sounds together. And she gradually would read out, she'd take a book worth reading, like The Wizard of Oz, and have me read some, and then, and then she'd read a whole bunch, and I'd read three or four words, and then gradually I read more and more. There's other kids that are whole word learners, and if you've got a whole word learner, don't shove phonics down their throat. You know, the bottom line is let's start out with a book that's worth reading, something to care about, and then um, use the reading method that works for that kid. And then some dyslexic kids see the print jiggle on the page. And so try printing a book on different pale colored papers, like light tan, lavender, real pale colors, and let the kid pick out the right color that works for them. That doesn't work for all dyslexia, but you're talking about so, something so simple. I've seen students that would have flunked out of school if they hadn't put lavender paper in the printer. Another way of working with that, a lot of notebook dividers, don't be it, a lot of notebook dividers are clear plastic and they come in different colors. Well, you so can use that. That's right, you can use that. That's an overlay. 
Yeah, you can use an overlay. Um, I found a lot of my students like the colored paper because the overlays got scratched up and then they were hard to. But then you can use them with a real book as yeah. opposed to a printed page. Or you can just take a copier and copy the book too. Yes, it's true. Back. <laughs> okay. Um, as someone on the spectrum and uh, actually engaging in uh, social media, specifically um, uh, on YouTube, to work on improving the situation for people with uh, autism and that. Uh, do you have anything uh, that really strikes you that is uh, going, uh, looks amazing uh, to you? Well, I think one of the things is I'd rather show, when I went into the cattle industry as a woman, one of the ways I got accepted was to make myself really good at what I did. That the thing, you know, when I handled cattle, I did it well, and when I, um, I designed things, I did it well. When I started working for the magazine, I remember they almost didn't let me into the Arizona cattle feeders meeting. They let me in, and man, I made sure I covered that meeting accurately. That I did not misquote anybody. You see, then people got to respect me, because when I covered the Arizona cattle feeders meeting, it was covered accurately. And people started to respect that. You know, pick out something and get really good at, then people start to respect you. And I had friends who shared interests. You know, when I was bullied and teased and horribly bullied in school, high school, uh, horseback riding friends, uh, skiing friends, uh, giant stilt friends, that's in the book, and uh, uh, model rockets and electronics. Could be music, it could be theater. Theater's a great field. Artificial intelligence is not gonna take theater away. Find something you're good at that you can do with other people and you can get respected for that. No, what are you good at doing? I'm actually doing quite well. I've, in four and a half months, I've gotten uh, 200 subscribers and uh, 3,000 Okay, what are you doing on the work front? Uh, work front, I work with people with disabilities. So are you doing that as an actual job? I do it for an actual job. I work for uh, agencies uh, doing, I don't know if you're, you're probably familiar with it, communal mobilization. Okay, yeah, different states, there's different yeah, names for different but things. Like, but you're actually out there doing this yeah, as a job, that's good. Yeah, this is just something I'm doing on the side, I'm actually working on the social media. The other thing you've got to do on the social media is you've got to kind of, um, uh, don't get sidelined on a lot of politics and stuff that can get you in trouble. You've got to sort of figure out what, what's really important for you to do. And you don't want to get off on a lot of, a lot of nasty stuff and get started that just hurts the stuff that you really care about. Well, I don't know what side you're talking about. Well, the first one of the problems you have with autism is you got the same name for Silicon Valley programmer. Einstein didn't speak until three. Uh, Steve Jobs was probably on the spectrum. Edison was probably on the spectrum. Tesla, who invented the power plant, yeah. was probably on the spectrum. And then you get somebody with much more severe problems, maybe a lot of medical problems too, on top of the autism. And it's all called the same thing. I think what we got to do is we got to look at what people can do. Let's say it's somebody who's more severe. I had a doctor tell me about a guy that was really severe, and he taught him how to make coffee for the local gas station store, and that gave the guy meaning in life because he made really good coffee, and people appreciated it. They know the difference between fake work and real work. And then after he retired from the store, he served the coffee and made the coffee at the local nursing home, and people appreciated that. Okay. Um, well, first I want to thank you for letting everybody know, uh, everybody know the advantages, the great advantages of that people on the spectrum have great skills. And, uh, well, the thing is, what tends to happen in autism, and there's a new paper that came out that basically says the brain, the same genes that give human beings a huge brain also cause autism and schizophrenia. And in autism, you get overgrowth from the back of the brain, which is going to give you memory, it might give you math ability, art ability, word memory ability, foreign language ability, but then you shortchange the social circuits. With schizophrenia, you get undergrowth. Uh, but it all involves the, the same genetics that makes a big brain. You know, so there's no way to totally get rid of it. It's embedded in the system. 
I went out, I be involved right now in a research project where I had my whole genome, my genome's been completely sequenced. And I found out why I've got all these physical problems. Yeah, my teeth, missing six teeth, explained. Nails break off, explained. Horrible skin that's dreadful, explained. Heart murmur, explained. A little bleeding problem, explained. But it doesn't completely explain the autism because the genes are embedded. Yeah, there's some genes there. But you can't get rid of them because of the same genes that make human beings have a large brain. Well, hey, what, what about the creative process with all the noise and chaos in the world? Um, how, how is it possible to focus on being creative and getting to that creative process? Well, first of all, on a lot of things, people tend to look at things too broadly. I mean, I've worked on something, I worked on cattle, how cattle were handled. That's not the whole thing. I had a girl one time, and she was a just a regular student, a freshman in an English class at a university, and she says, well, I'm interested in social justice. Well, pick out something you can actually work on, like helping homeless people in, in the city. Something specific that you can actually do. Otherwise, you can't get anything done in the abstract. Uh, hey, hi, Temple. Uh, my name, I hope I wasn't cutting uh, these cats off. Uh, so I, I just had a question. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. My name is William, and I, like everyone else, really appreciate you being here. Uh, secondly, my, my question is, um, people on the autistic spectrum very much report saying they, they have like this, this double-edged sword to their personality to the point where they're, they're very brilliant and they, they have these uh, unusual abilities, but at the same time, they, they also tend to, tend to lack uh, abilities for, for daily living skills or for social communication. Well, like thing in the 50s, you see, I've had a lot of granddads come up to me. Granddads have had successful careers. And when the grandkids get diagnosed, granddad's finding out he's on the spectrum. He may have been an engineer, an accountant, or some other, you know, decent job. But you see, in my generation, social skills were taught in a much more structured way. You were taught how to shake hands, how close to somebody to stand. Not to tell the same story over and over again because it completely bores people. <laughs> and where on some older person where a diagnosis has helped is on their relationships, not on their career stuff. Well, my, my question is, um, it, as far as like in New York City, we have an absolutely huge homeless problem. And uh, a lot of it is, is people who, who are mentally ill. And a lot of that can be for people who are on the autistic spectrum. And at the same time, you also have places like Google and Facebook, which, which you say have a lot of engineers that are on the well, spectrum. Well, they're on the spectrum. Yeah, but at the same time, so what I'm saying is you have all these high-paying jobs with people on the spectrum, and you have all these homeless people who are also Well, on first the of all, first of all, if you want to do something about that, the first thing you do is take out some, you know, figure out some specific area to work on it and start finding out, this is the bottom approach, okay, what are, the, are they, are they addicted to drugs? Or is it, um, uh, the, you know, try to find out what's, um, why they're on the street, then gradually trying to do something about it. I worked with three different designers, brilliant designers, one that I think was on the spectrum, the other two weren't, and uh, they'd be on drugs and alcohol if they weren't on Prozac. I've been on antidepressant medication since my early 30s, and, that's, and that controls a tremendous anxiety. And the big mistake made with antidepressants is too high a dose. Uh, my whole ex personal experience with that is in my book, Thinking in Pictures. It's still accurate even though it's 20 years old. My question is, uh, for, for most people that you deal with on the autistic spectrum, what is the, the main difference between uh, whether they're able to function in society and whether they're not able to function in society? Well, first of all, I gotta figure out where the problem is. Let's just look at the job from. First of all, you just gotta get up and get to work every day. And then maybe leave the, the uh, political talk at home. It's really not welcome at work, just leave it at home. Uh, I vote, but that's private. And, and you've got to look at where the specific problem is. Uh, make yourself really good at what you do. I, I worked a lot of freelance stuff. And one advantage of that is that I avoided a lot of the politics you know, in the different places. So I'd come in, design the project, get it started up, and then I'd go on and do something else. But I can't even help you unless I specifically know what, what the exact problem is. Are you employed? What are you good at? Well, maybe you need to just get a job at a store somewhere. Now, what I would avoid stuff that's too hectic. I'll tell you what not to do. Shove you in this bookstore during the holiday rush. <laughs> now, now, 
now starting out like here right now would be fine. Uh, McDonald's lunch rush. Too much multitasking, too hectic. But other than that, maybe you need to just get a job in a store somewhere and just learn how to work. Just a, you know, a job, it's something that's not too hectic. I ran into a kid uh, yesterday, uh, just the other day at the newsstand at one of the airports. And he said, he told me he was on the spectrum. And that airport newsstand is not real hectic. Everybody lines up quietly to buy their stuff. You don't have five different lines all at once doing, doing stuff in there. Ladies and gentlemen, we have time for two more questions. We're gonna take our first in the back right here. Hello, this is an, uh, it, very much an honor, uh, Dr. Brandon. Um, I'm, I'm uh, excuse me, this is a very loud microphone. Uh, I am incredibly uh, high on the spectrum, and I'm actually uh, building a business as a professional performer, which I'm, uh, is amazing. And is that working out amazing well for you? Amazing feeling, I'm sorry? And that's working out well for you? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's a real privilege um, to, have to be doing that. My question is, um, from your original background, how long did it take to get comfortable public speaking? The first, when you, when the first, you first talk started. that I ever did in graduate school, I panicked and walked out. <laughs> then the thing I learned was to have really good slides. Now, if I don't have slides, what I've done here with this, this is kind of like a pilot's checklist right here of the different topics I was going to talk about. Because there's a problem with working memory. So I made a list here of bullet points of things to talk about. Then I can go down this. Because without this, I will ramble. And then what I'd have to do is just go immediately into questions. Uh, and then when I first started doing cattle talks, this was back in the 35 millimeter slide days, I had really good slides of things that like shadows and coats on fences, things that cattle would be afraid of, and I'd show those to people. Nobody else had those slides. And having really good slides is important. I have students that have to do 15 minute talks, research conference. And let's get your slides really good. So if you panic during that 12 minute talk, you can reach a PowerPoint. That's not great, but you're gonna live through it. Uh, so just start now, that's one thing to do. But if you don't have that, then a little piece of paper with the bullet points on it, like a pilot's checklist of the points that you're gonna go over. And for tasks that involve sequence, like taking apart the McDonald's ice cream machine and cleaning it, you know, step one, step two, step three, just little bullet points. One to three words, just to trigger the memory for the tear down steps, the cleaning steps, and then the reassembly steps. Because working memory is a problem, and multitasking is a problem. Okay, one more quickie. Hi, can you please describe how sensory processing disorder has affected you during your life or during your work, either as a child or now in adulthood? Well, sensory processing is extremely variable. I have no visual processing problems. You see, there's some people that when there's too much like checkerboard patterns and things like that, they'll see it vibrating. I don't have that problem. Sensory issues are extremely variable. I do have some auditory processing problems where I do not hear hard consonant sounds. So when I had to learn to talk, my speech teacher would hold up a cup and she'd go cup and then she'd go cup, where she'd slow down. Another thing that teachers need to do is give the kid time to respond. They're like a phone on one bar. You've got to give them time to load the web page so that they can respond. I had touch sensitivity, you know, and I, that the squeezing machine helped reduce some of that. But sensory issues are extremely variable. They are definitely real. There's no question about that. There's, again, extra circuits in the back. But they're variable. I don't have visual problems. Another child would have visual problems. There are a lot of dyslexic kids that have visual processing problems, which I don't have. Don't overgeneralize. And in my book, The Autistic Brain, I've got you know, a fairly recent review on, the, on some of the sensory problems. Also, I talk about the different the photorealistic visual thinker and the pattern thinker, and I pr provide research to back up what I'm saying about that. Okay, well, I want to thank you all for coming. <laughs>